All right, section 11.2 is on series. Now, last section or last lesson, we discussed sequences. And we're going to see how we take a sequence and can build it into a series. So when we add the terms of an infinite sequence, we get an infinite series of the form a1 plus a2 plus blah, 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 up to an, which is the general term. And this could be denoted using sigma notation as the sum i equals 1 to infinity of a sub i, or just as the sum a sub i. Now, a partial sum, s sub n, is the nth partial sum of the infinite series from n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n. So to get an idea for what this partial sum is, let's look at it in its expanded form. So S1, the first partial sum, would just consist of the first term of the sequence, A1. That's it. S2, the second partial sum, is the sum of the first two terms of the sequence. S3 would be the sum of the first three terms, and the pattern continues. So the nth partial sum consists of the sum of the first n terms. So here in summation notation, this means my index of summation i starts at 1. So I take the first term and I sum up all the way up until the nth term, a sub n. Make sure when you're representing this, you switch your index to i and you have a sub i because n is reserved for the nth term, the last term. So this cannot have an n anymore. All right, let's look at an example to help us get more familiarized with this idea. So we have the sum, infinite sum, from n equals 1 to infinity of n squared plus 1. So listing out the first few terms, if I substitute in 1 for n, I'd get 1 squared plus 1. That's the first term. That's a1. And then since this is a series that I'm going to add to it, a2, 2 squared plus 1, this is a3, etc. So S1, the first partial sum, is just a1, which would be 2. S2, the second partial sum, is a1 plus a2. Well, a1 was 2, and a2 is 5, so S2 is 7. S3 is going to be, well, I can just take the previous partial sum and add the next term to it, right? So S3 would be S2 plus A3. So S2, we have that it was 7 plus A3 right here, 3 squared plus 1, that's 10. So this is 17. Let's do one more, S4. That's S3 plus A4. So that's going to be 17 plus, well, A4, we don't have it listed out here, but I can just get it by substituting 4 for N. So that's going to be 4 squared plus 1, which is 17. So 17 plus 17, 34, etc. All right, and then notice here, I could list these terms. S1 is 2. S2 is 7, S3 is 17, S4 is 34. Those make a new sequence, 2, 7, 17, 34, and it continues forever. So generally listing them out, S1, comma S2, S3, all the way up to S sub n, this is now a sequence of partial sums. So you can think of this as almost a new sequence that's built by adding up the terms from your original sequence a sub n. Okay, well why are we talking about this sequence of partial sums? Well because it gives us a lot of information about the infinite series. And here's the important part. If s sub n, the sequence of partial sums, is convergent, so if that sequence is convergent, then the infinite series from n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n is also convergent. And they both have the same limit. So if the sequence of partial sums is convergent, then my infinite series for a sub n is also convergent. And bonus, 
the sum of the series is equal to the limit of the sequence of partial sums. Now this is very rare. In this chapter, we're gonna be studying and investigating the convergence of infinite series. And very rarely are we able to find out what the actual sum is. So this is one special case where if we're able to evaluate the limit of the partial sums, the sequence of partial sums, then we do indeed have the sum of the series if it converges. Okay, so let's look at an example. Determine whether the series converges or diverges by expressing SN, the sequence of partial sums, as a telescoping sum. Find the sum if it converges. So they're giving us a hint. They're telling us that this is a telescoping sum. And I'll show you exactly what that means. So let's first write out an expression for SN and then work with it from there. Now, please have some caution here. SN, the sequence of partial sums, is the sum, now I have to change my index. It starts from i equals one up until n, n being the last or the nth term in this partial sum of the terms here. So this is gonna be two over, now my index of summation is i, so I have to switch this to i squared plus four i plus three. You cannot have the same variable there as what the final term is gonna be, that wouldn't make any sense. All right, now I want to write this as a telescoping sum. So that means that when I'm expressing the sum of the terms, a lot of the terms in the middle are going to cancel out and it's all going to collapse like a telescope collapses. So either you're going to use some partial fractions or some other techniques. We have another example after this, but I'm thinking let's do partial fractions because this denominator factors. So I can write this as i equals 1 to n of 2 over i plus 3 times i plus 1. All right. And then using partial fraction decomposition, I can rewrite this as the sum i equals 1 to n of negative 1 over i plus 3 plus 1 over i plus 1. All right. Now, if you forgot your partial fractions, I'll just give you a little reminder here. So aside, we have two over i plus three times i plus one equals a over i plus one plus b over i plus three. And then multiplying through by the LCD, I would get 2 equals AI plus 3A plus BI plus B. And then grouping my terms together, so A plus B must equal 0 because there's no I's on the other side. And then 3A plus B, my constant terms, equal 2. I can subtract this top equation from the bottom one, b will cancel out, and I get 2a equals 2. That means a is 2, and so if a is 2, I mean a is 1, so if a is 1, then b has to be negative 1. All right, so there's our partial fraction decomposition. Now, back to the problem. Okay, expressing this partial sum. So, S sub N, I'm gonna list out the first few terms, okay? So I'm gonna substitute in I equals one into the expression here. Okay, so substituting in I equals one, I'm gonna get negative one over four plus one half. Okay, that's the first term. Plus, now let's do i equals 2, so that would be negative 1 over 5 plus 1 over 3. Okay, let's keep going. Plus, I don't see a pattern yet, i equals 3, this is going to be negative 1 over 6 plus 1 over 4 plus 
Let's do now i equals 4. So this is i equals 4. I'm going to have negative 1 over 7 plus 1 over 5. Okay, now notice what's going on here. This is why it's called telescoping. So I have this negative 1 fourth, which is going to cancel out with the positive 1 fourth here. Also, I have this negative 1 fifth, which is going to cancel with the positive 1 fifth here. And then if I kept going, my next term, I would be able to cancel out the negative 1 sixth. What would not cancel out? I mean, this negative 1 seventh would eventually cancel out, but nothing would cancel out with the 1 half or the 1 third. Those remain. Okay, so we listed out the first four terms. I'm confident that the good rest in the middle are gonna cancel out. Now let's see what happens for the last few terms, okay? So since I listed out the first four, the last term would be i equals n. Before that would be i equals n minus one, and before that would be i equals n minus two. So let's list out, let's start with i equals n minus two. All right, so if I substitute in n minus 2 for i, that's going to be n minus 2 plus 3 in the denominator. So that's negative 1 over n plus 1 plus, and then again, if I'm substituting in n minus 2 here, n minus 2 plus 1, that's going to be n minus 1. So I have 1 over n minus 1 in the denominator. All right, what would come next? It would be i equals n minus 1. So same thing. If I substitute n minus 1 into the denominator, n minus 1 plus 3, that's n plus 2. So I have negative 1 over n plus 2 plus n minus 1 plus 1. That's just n. So 1 over n. And then plus, let's do the last one, i equals n. So if i equals n, I would just have negative 1 over n plus 3 plus 1 over n plus 1. So can you see what's going to cancel out? Well, this 1 over n plus 1 is going to cancel with the negative 1 over n plus 1. And if I kept listing more terms, then the one prior would have... The 1 over n cancel out, right? I'd have a negative 1 over n. This would cancel out eventually. What would not cancel out? Well, negative 1 over n plus 2 would not cancel out. Neither would negative 1 over n plus 3. And you can always list more terms if you need until you see a pattern. One thing that will always happen in a telescoping series is however many terms survive at the beginning in the first few terms. So in this case, we had like two survivors that didn't cancel out. You're going to have the same number at the end. Okay. And then also another thing to notice is that the denominators, when we had this partial fraction decomposition, they were I plus three and I plus one, right? So those are two units apart. So that also comes into play with the fact that there were two terms in the beginning and two at the end that didn't cancel. All right, so now I can rewrite Sn as 1 half plus 1 third minus 1 over n plus 2 minus 1 over n plus 3. And remember now, if I want to figure out whether or not my series or my sum converges, or diverges, I'm going to take the limit as n approaches infinity of s sub n. So that's going to be the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 half plus 1 third minus 1 over n plus 2 minus 1 over n plus 3. Now as n goes to infinity, 1 half and 1 third are constants. The other terms go to 0 since we have a constant over a denominator that's getting larger and larger. And so I'm just left with 1 half plus 1 third, which is 5 over 6. 
So since that limit exists as a finite number, I can say my series converges. Very exciting. And in fact, this is the sum. So I can write S as in the sum of my series, write what the original series was, n equals 1 to infinity of 2 over n squared plus 4n plus 3. This equals 5 over 6. And therefore, it converges. Okay, nicely done. Let's look at another example of a telescoping series. In this case, we have a natural log. So we have the sum n equals 1 to infinity of the natural log of n over n plus 1. So first I'm going to write an expression for s sub n. So we have the sum, remember change your index to i equals 1 to n of the natural log of, and change it here as well, i over i plus 1. All right, if your notation is not perfect, it is considered incorrect and you'll lose points. Now from here, remember for telescoping, we wanted to have terms cancel out when we were adding them together, so I need some sort of addition or subtraction to go on. That's why last time we did the partial fractions. Well, this time I'm going to use my properties of logarithms, so I can rewrite natural log of i over i plus 1 using subtraction. So this is the sum, i equals 1 to n, natural log of i minus natural log of i plus 1. All right, so let's start listing out the first few terms. So if I substitute in 1 for i, I'm going to have natural log of 1 minus natural log of 2. So this is for i equals 1. Plus... Now for i equals 2, I'm going to have natural log of 2 minus natural log of 3 plus, let's keep going until you feel comfortable that you see a pattern. Let's substitute in i equals 3. We have natural log of 3 minus natural log of 4. All right, do we see any patterns emerging? Well, first things first, natural log of 1, that's just 0. And then here already things are canceling out. So ln of 2's cancel out, ln of 3's cancel out. Wow, okay. So technically the only one that didn't cancel was this ln of 1, which is 0, because in the very next one, ln of 4 would cancel out, right? Plus, dot, dot, dot. And then let's start at the last end. So let's do the last three like last time. So we can do i equals n minus 2. So we would have ln of n minus 2 minus ln of n minus 2 plus 1 is going to be n minus 1 plus, and the next one we'll do i equals n minus 1. So this would be ln of n minus 1 minus natural log of just n this time. Plus, and then last one, i equals n, we'll have natural log of n minus natural log of n plus 1. That's for i equals n. Okay, so do we see any cancellation? Definitely. So ln of n is gone. ln of n minus 1 cancels out. And then I know ln of n minus 2 would cancel out, right, for i equals n minus 3. So the only term that survives is the last one, just like the first one did here, one on each side. And I expect that because the difference here is just by one. All right. So now this means S sub n. See how it telescopes? Everything collapses in the middle. So S sub n equals the uh, negative natural log of n plus one. So now, in order to determine whether or not the series is convergent or divergent, I need to take the limit as n goes to infinity of s sub n. So the limit as n goes to infinity of s sub n is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of negative ln of n plus 1. Well, what's this limit going to be? Well, imagine the graph of natural log, right? As n approaches infinity, natural log approaches infinity, and then since I have that minus sign, this is going to approach negative infinity. So what does that tell me? 
That's not a finite number. Therefore, my series, n equals 1 to infinity, natural log of n over n plus 1 is also divergent. All right. That means it does not sum up to a finite number. I want you to notice something, though. The infinite series is divergent. What are the terms? What's the sequence of those terms, though? a sub n is natural log of n over n plus 1. Now, last section, we looked at the limits of sequences. So the limit as n approaches infinity of natural log of n over n plus 1. Well, natural log's continuous, so I can pass the limit through. So I have natural log of the limit as n approaches infinity of n over n plus 1. This is going to approach 1. So this is natural log of 1, which is 0. So the limit of the terms is 0. But the sum, that infinite series, that does not converge. So we're going to study that interesting scenario a lot more throughout the chapter. Okay, another kind of series which are fairly easy to test whether or not they converge or diverge are geometric series. So remember, geometric series are ones that have a common ratio, r, meaning that to get from one term to the next, you're multiplying by r, by some constant. And we express an infinite geometric series in the form sum, equals, um, sum of n equals 1 to infinity of c times r to the n minus 1. And it converges as long as the absolute value of r is less than 1. Basically, that would mean that term to term is shrinking, right? Because you're multiplying by a fraction. And we can compute that infinite sum as a sub 1, so the first term, divided by 1 minus r. It diverges otherwise, okay? That's great. So now, let's determine whether or not the following series is convergent or divergent. Find its sum if it is convergent. Again, it's super rare to be able to find the sum. So really treasure this section because this is special stuff. Telescoping and geometric, that's when you can find the sum. All right, so let's look here. 1 eighth minus 1 fourth plus 1 half minus 1. So it looks like it's geometric. In order to find r, all you need to do is take one term and divide it by the term that precedes it. So r equals negative 1 fourth over 1 eighth. And that's going to be negative 2. And if it's a true geometric series, that r is going to be constant from term to term. So it doesn't matter which two you divide. You just take one, divide it by the term that precedes it. Well, our test is pretty straightforward. Absolute value of r is going to be the absolute value of negative 2, and this is greater than 1. So since this is a geometric series, and r, absolute value of r is greater than 1, that means it diverges. And we're done. So I can't find its sum. It doesn't have a finite sum. Great. Next one, we have the sum, n equals 1 to infinity e to the n over 3 to the n plus 1. So this is already written in summation notation. I just have to figure out how I can rewrite the expression for the series so that I can identify what r is. So notice a sub n, the terms, are represented by e to the n over 3 to the n plus 1. So I can rewrite the denominator as 3 to the n times 3 to the first, right? And then now I can regroup things so that I just have the one-third times e divided by 3 to the n. So whatever quantity is being raised to the n, that's your r right there. So this tells me, indeed, this is a geometric series. r is equal to e over 3. And the absolute value of r is equal to the absolute value of e over 3. And we know e is about 2.7, 2.7 divided by 3, that's going to be less than 1. So this tells me my series is convergent. So if I want to find its sum, since I know it converges and it's geometric, I have a lovely formula, a sub 1 over 1 minus r. When you just see s written this way, that means the infinite sum, okay? If it's a sum of a partial sequence, it's going to have an index at the bottom telling you where it's stopping. 
So this equals a sub one is the first term. So if I plug in one for n here, I'm gonna have e over three to the one plus one or three squared, so that's e over nine. So a one is e over nine over one minus e over three. Then I'm gonna multiply everything through by nine. So I clear out the fraction. So we're gonna have e over nine minus three e. And I can factor out a three from the denominator. So I have e over three times three minus e. So I have a convergent geometric series and here is its sum. All right. Nice, now some very exciting theorems. First theorem tells us if the sum n equals one to infinity of a sub n is convergent, so if my infinite series is convergent, then the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is zero. That means the terms go to zero. If I know my series converges, then the terms go to zero. Notice the converse statement if the terms go to zero, if the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is zero, then the series is convergent. That is not true, necessarily, okay? I need an a sub n here. For example, most classic example of where this fails is the harmonic series. So the harmonic series is so famous it has its own little name. So it's the sum n equals one to infinity of one over n. So if you list out the first few terms, it would be one plus a half plus a third, et cetera. And the terms go to zero, right? The limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n of one over n, that limit is zero, but the series is divergent. Why is that? Well, even though the terms are going to zero, even though the terms are shrinking, they're not shrinking fast enough so that when you're adding them up, that sum approaches a finite number. So they're shrinking, but just not quickly enough. Keep that in mind. However, the contrapositive of the theorem above is true, right? Anytime you have a statement, a true statement, it's contrapositive is always gonna be true. And the contrapositive of this theorem is the test for divergence. So the test for divergence tells us if the terms of a series so if the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n does not equal zero, or if it does not exist, then I know my series or the sum n equals one to infinity of a sub n is divergent. So basically, if these terms aren't going to zero, there is no chance that you're gonna be able to add them up forever and have your series converge or approach a finite number. And you should always, if you're being asked to test for convergence or divergence of a series, run the test for divergence at least mentally before you get going okay throughout the chapter you're going to learn many different tests for convergence or divergence of a series and this is one you want to always check first okay a couple more theorems if you have two series that you know are convergent already so if the sum of a n and the sum of b n are both convergent then you are allowed to distribute the summation across addition and subtraction, and you're allowed to multiply through and take a constant outside of the sum. However, if you do not know that your series a n or b n are convergent to begin with, then you are not allowed to do the following. And you may seem a little strange because normally we think addition and subtraction are associative, but series are a lot more tricky or high maintenance of quantities to deal with. And just an example to drive this point home. So say you have the series, let's consider one plus negative one plus one plus negative one plus one plus negative one. It just goes on like that, okay? Is this series convergent? Well, you have to ask yourself, is the sequence of partial sums is that sequence convergent? Well, what would the partial sums be? So the first partial sum S1 would just be the first term, which is one. The second partial sum would be the sum of the first two terms. So one plus negative one, that's zero. 
S3 would be the sum of the first three terms. So 0 plus 1, which is 1. S4 is 0. S5 is 1, etc. Now look, is this sequence here convergent? Does it have a limit? As n approaches infinity, does it approach some constant? No. It bounces or it oscillates between 1 and 0, 1 and 0. However, now here's where things can get dangerous. If I introduce grouping symbols, so if I group these two terms together, if I group these next two terms together, if I group these two terms together, now I'm changing the order of operation. So I would add those two together, 1 and negative 1, so S1 would be 0. This sum is also 0. So S2 would be the sum of 0 plus 0, which is 0. S3 would be 0 plus 0 plus 0, which is 0. So in this case, it is convergent. That's why you have to be careful that you do not distribute summations across addition or subtraction unless you know that these two series are convergent to begin with. Okay, so watch as I work through the next examples because I'm going to do so very carefully and methodically and you need to do the same. All right, so we have the sum, n equals one to infinity, 0.8 to the n plus one minus 0.3 to the n. So I wanna determine whether or not it's convergent or divergent and if it's convergent, find the sum. So I'm gonna consider each of these series separately to begin with. So I'm just gonna consider the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 0.8 to the n plus 1. Okay, now what can I say about this series? Well, it's clearly geometric. r equals 0.8. And the absolute value of r is absolute value of 0.8, which is less than 1. So that means that series converges. I can find its sum. Its sum is a1 over 1 minus r. So a1, if I substitute a 1 for n, that's going to be 0.8 squared, so 0.64 over 1 minus 0.8. So 0.64 divided by 0.2, that's going to be 3.2. Okay. Now let's separately consider another geometric series, the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 0.3 to the n. This is also geometric. r equals 0.3, and the absolute value of r, that would be the absolute value of 0.3, is less than 1, which tells me it also converges. Okay, I can find its sum, right? I have a nice formula for geometric series. So the first term would just be 0.3 to the first, so 0.3 over 1 minus r, 1 minus 0.3. So that's 0.3 divided by 0.7, which is 3 sevenths. So what does this tell me now? Well, according to my theorem, then the difference of these two series must also be convergent. So the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 0.8 to the n plus 1 minus 0.3 to the n. Now I'm allowed to distribute the summation across the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 0.8 to the n plus 1 minus the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 0.3 to the n. This would equal 3.2 minus 3 over 7 and then getting your common denominator, this is 97 over 35, okay? So your work needs to be done in this way. You are not allowed to distribute or write this statement until you've first shown and justified that each of these series is indeed convergent, okay? Then you're allowed to write that last line that I have. Okay. Last example for the lesson, we have the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 3 over 5 to the n plus 2 over n. Okay, so first let's consider 3 over 5 to the n. So we have the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 3 over 5 to the n. 
And I can take the three outside the sum, n equals one to infinity, and I have one fifth to the n. Now this is geometric, again. Absolute value of r is the absolute value of one fifth, which is less than one, and that converges. So I can find its sum. This is gonna be equal to three times a one, so if I substitute in 1 for n, I'm going to have 1 fifth over 1 minus r, 1 minus 1 fifth. So that's going to be 3 times 1 fifth divided by, that's going to be 4 over 5, or times 5 over 4. Fives are going to cancel, so this is 3 fourths. Okay, so that's the sum of that little series. Now I'm going to consider the second part, 2 over n. So now consider the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 2 over n. Well, this is the 2 times the sum of n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n. And this, I know, is the harmonic series. So 2 times that is a multiple of the harmonic series. And what did we just say about the harmonic series on the previous page? It actually diverges. We'll show why later. So what does that mean about my overall series? Well, if one part diverges, the whole series diverges. So we have to rewrite the original. So this implies that the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 3 over 5 to the n plus 2 over n also diverges. All right, and make sure you just do your homework very carefully. Write out everything properly, justifying along the way, and rewrite the original series at the end of a problem. Okay, so that concludes the lesson. Stay tuned for more.